Hello, everyone, again, and we are here at the Onco Daily, and today is uh, our series Onco Influencers, and we have a great honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Douglas Flora, one of the um, most positive and most uh, known people in um, AI and oncology field, I would say. Um, Dr. Flora is the Executive Medical Director of Oncology Services at St. Elizabeth Healthcare, and he is the Editor-in-Chief of AI in Precision Oncology, um, and he is the Regional Board Vice-Chair of the American Cancer Society, and he is the Treasurer of the Executive Board for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. He has a long list of accomplishments and a huge uh, CV and background, but uh, I'll leave it to him uh, to explore it during our talk. Dr. Flora, thank you very much for being with us and for being a guest. I know how busy you are. Thanks for finding a time for us. Thanks Welcome for to Uncle Daily. So uh, without further ado, uh, I mean, when I was introducing you, first I said, I mean, he's one of the most well-known people in the AI and oncology field. Why is it like that? Well, you know, I guess I'm a, I'm a medical oncologist here in the States, and I found myself completely overwhelmed by my life. Um, as an oncologist, I was about two hours behind a day three or four years ago, and I realized something had to give. It was either going to be me and burnout and frustration, or I had to find a, a way to work smarter, not harder. So I started to study AI as a means of self-preservation. And then I realized that it might preserve the other 19,000 oncologists in the States as well and started getting out there and trying to spread the good word that the things that I was using in my daily life could probably help them too. Well, that's a very valid explanation, I think. And you had a post today, right? That uh, more than 90% of physicians in the United States um, report feeling burned out on a regular basis, right? So it's a huge problem. It is. And I, you... so I, I have a cancer center around me with about 60 doctors, and I would say most of them have experienced that at some point in their lives and, and maybe not all at the same time. But uh, you're well aware the documentation burdens that are on us, the um, 4000 new papers released in oncology every day. I, I just don't know how we're expected to get caught up and still have a, a balance of health and family and exercise and those sorts of things. So this for me has uh, become a bit of a mission to try and deliver these tools into the hands of those 60 doctors and other. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed I have a little bit more free time. Well, I won't say free time. I have a little bit more freedom in my schedule than an oncologist since I'm not scheduled in the clinic every day. I see patients on Wednesdays only. And the other four days, I have a little bit more freedom to experiment with things like this. Um, so when we talk about AI, most of the people are like kind of feeling fear or anxiety, thinking that, AI or robots are going to push us out from the field. What's your opinion about it? Should we worry about? Yeah, that's the rub, isn't it? Everybody's, we're stuck between scary, Siri and Skynet. I'm an optimist in everything. I think um, we learned some valuable lessons when the EHR came out and when insurance companies took over our worlds uh, here in the States, that clinicians have to be front and center in the development and deployment of these tools. And so I'm really trying to make sure that the physicians that I know are keeping up to date with these technologies and helping build the right answers uh, to our problems uh, rather than having them handed to us by industry or by, um, by the government. And so that would be issue one. Number two is, I don't know what we do if we don't find these tools. You know, we, we can't continue at the current pace and it's not good patient care when you're racing from room to room and typing. Uh, so I'm excited about things that would relieve us of things like documentation burdens and fighting with the electronic medical record. That's true, and but like, what about? I mean, some of the some of the AIs are really, I mean, and they are showing some good results with the giving a correct diagnosis. Or I mean, let's let's go for example for the radiology, and a lot of right now startups or even big companies are working on uh, like putting a lot of radiology images in the in the AI, and it's giving like very precise diagnosis. It is. So, I mean, I mean, is it like that it's pushing a lot of people out of the workplace or, or from the market? 
I mean, we are just talking about the positive side. And of course, I mean, I totally agree with you. I'm also on the positive side. But I mean, what should we expect in the future about it? There are some McKinsey reports that suggest that about 40% of people's work will be eliminated by these machines. And so I think it's inherent upon us as clinicians and healthcare leaders to figure that out and help our teams, help our staff retool and refit. You know, we don't have um, carriage drivers anymore. We don't have people growing hay in New York for horses. Um, we have mechanics and, and uh, things like that. So this is to me an evolution um, to say it's a tool. It's not going to fix all of our problems in healthcare. I think it's still a, the most human um, occupation you and I could have chosen. Uh, but I, I think that if we enable ourselves with these tools, we'll be more efficient. We'll be able to touch more patients. Uh, and what's going to remain? As you well, said, we're one of the realistic. I do worry a little bit about um, the, the pattern doctors. <laughs> we already have apps that can recognize melanoma with a high degree of accuracy. We have um, pathology programs in abundance that can read slides with nuance and um, pixelated digital slides um, to pick up cancers that even dedicated academic specialists can't see. And you've mentioned radiology. And, and I, I think that our job will be kind of like the chef at the end of the assembly line of food. We have to taste it. We have to make sure it's the right amount of salt. We have to make sure it has the right flavor, that it's well-prepared. Um, and as an oncologist, that means we have to hug the patient. We have to hold the hand. We have to look into the daughter's eyes. We have to express the degrees of empathy that we're willing to go into the depths of the caves with our patients. Computers will never solve that equation. Yeah, so the empathy is certainly is going to stay. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's going to bring us back to the like more humanistic profession, right? That's so that's hope. also a positive side of our of our profession, which is going to remain. You said, I mean, you have around 60 oncologists, right, at, at your centers, and you have helped to build two cancer uh, services, right, cancer centers. Yeah, we have and, six total here in northern Kentucky. This is ground zero for cancer in the States. Um, we have a ton of smoking still, which is not as common over here. Uh, we have a lot of lung cancer and uh, we're first in the country for lung cancer diagnoses and deaths. And so there's plenty of room for improvement. And that's what we're encouraged about. We now have six cancer centers for my system and we're rolling out really high quality care to some communities that haven't had access uh, to subspecialists and genomic medicine and um, germline mutational analyses and screening and prevention. So uh, I'm excited about the promise. There's a lot of communities that need more of it, uh, but we're working our way towards them. Yeah. Uh, why AI in precision oncology? Why did you choose this name for the journal if you were the one to choose? Sure. Well, I mean, I, that is our specific goal was to make smarter decisions using technologies that will allow us to be more precise in our care. You and I have spent our careers giving these very toxic drugs with very modest uh, benefit. You know, I, I was a breast cancer doctor for about 15 years and I would treat hundred women with AC and Taxol to maybe save three of them. Wouldn't it be better if you and I could go upstream and prevent the diseases at those transition points uh, when they were about to become a cancer or screen them so that they're found when they're in situ two or stage one rather than stage three and nodal, uh, nodal extension. Uh, and so these tools will give us the ability to discern those patterns earlier whether it be with circulating tumor cells or minimal residual disease or better reads of scans or mammograms or MRI, et cetera. And so I guess I'm enthusiastic about the promise that tools like this will make us both better at our jobs, which means our patients win. Uh, uh, are, are you getting enough papers uh, on, on the topic? Is it like uh, the field is enough like for the, for the journal? Yeah, I mean, there are, as I mentioned, there's 4,000 papers coming out each each day in oncology. So there are plenty of papers there. Um, I, I would say it's a struggle for all young journals to get the highest quality manuscripts. And so we've been very visible. Part of my um, enthusiasm online is I just want people to know that this is the only journal that does this. There are great journals that are New England Journal of Medicine AI that I read every week online. Um, that are covering some of these bigger topics, but for oncologists, I'm trying to make this as practical as possible. I'm not putting higher math in there. We're trying to curate content that is applicable to your daily life and my daily life, like how do we make better decisions? How do we replace algorithms to go 60 pages uh, to get to 
you know, medium recommendations for four or five different drugs when there are decision algorithms that could be run with a high degree of certainty of, of a better benefit for the patient. Um, you know, overall, I guess the AI and precision oncology was because we have been the least precise of all specialties for so time, for so long. I'm enthusiastic that these targets and these tools can let us uh, work smarter and not harder and not hurt as many people while we're trying to help. Uh, you said 4,000 papers a day in general, in medicine or in oncology? In medicine, yeah. In medicine. How do you keep up? That's, that's huge. That's huge, really. So it's, I mean, that's why sometimes when people say, I mean, expert in the field, I mean, I, I, I'm I, really, I mean, I'm sorry for the experts because <laughs> to be an expert in, in that narrow field, you need like, I mean, it's it's really difficult. And uh, so why did you choose oncology coming back to, the, to your career? Well, historically, that was my least favorite specialty. So my mom passed away early of uh, metastatic breast cancer. I was pre-med at the time. And um, obviously that's an inflection point for any young boy. Interestingly, my brother chose the same route. And so my brother, Dan Flora, is a cancer researcher downstairs in my building seeing patients right now after his breast tumor board just wrapped up. Uh, and, and I think that wires someone differently. If you've gone through that experience and um, been affected that deeply, we went into this wanting to save more people from feeling like our family felt. And maybe being the oncologist, we thought that our mom deserved. Uh, she had a very smart oncologist, a very good oncologist, but she was very, very busy. And I can remember feeling rushed and not having time to have my que questions answered. And um, it was just a terrifying time for a young kid. So I tried to be a different oncologist. And it's not rare for me to take an hour per patient all day long. And not everybody has that kind of luxury of time uh, that I get to spend with my patients now. Uh Given your experience in oncology, like you spent already two decades in oncology, right? At least. Thanks. Like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so what were the most significant changes you have seen in the cancer treatment, research, and patient care? I would say the most meaningful one for me as a breast doctor was the advent of HER2 therapies. You know, and, and I can remember a specific 27-year-old patient that I lost right before ASCO, whatever year that was, 2006 or 2007, um, that I lost before I had access to those drugs. Uh, but I can remember at ASCO, people were in tears. They were jumping up and down and crying and high-fiving when the data was first shared about um, the impact that we could have with Herceptin. Uh, that would be the most important one in my two decades, I'd say more recently, it's having, you know, many, many five-year survivors on immunotherapies. And like you, I, it's just changed the way that I practice medicine. I'll go see patients all day Wednesday, and I might only give chemo to two patients total because the advent of these targeted therapies, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and uh, immunotherapies has just taken over. Um, you touched a very sensitive topic, access to drugs. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's different in high income and low, in, uh, low income countries, but low middle income countries, but talking about the high income countries in the United States, right? Uh, in like the most powerful country, you, I mean, some of like majority of the centers outside of the, uh, of the place where the clinical trials, this uh, like specific clinical trial goes, patients usually don't have access to, to the treatments. Even to those treatments, when we see like signals, and we are talking about the life-threatening disease, and not only cancer, I mean, in like different life-threatening disease, but since we are oncologists, we can focus on cancer. Uh, and I think similar thing also happened. I was reading the 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 book about the global health um, uh, about the stories of Paul Farmer, the introduction to global health. And I think similar uh, situation was with HIV treatments back in the beginning of 80s. How we can change the paradigm that we get like quicker access, at least in the high income countries, then it will, I mean, and the next question I will ask also LMIC is how we can change the paradigm that we get like more access. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the, the driving principle, I think, for the second half of my career here, since I'm 52 now, 
And I've, I've, I find it offensive that we're not able to do that as a, as a human being. And the idea of health equity for me is, is it's our number one goal here. Um, and that's actually part of why I'm, I'm so keyed up about things like AI. I know that I'm not going to be able to imagine a day anytime soon where people in sub-Saharan Africa are going to have access to CT and PET scans, right? But could we do a plasma-based screening assay or a FIT test for or a Cologuard or something like that that provides similar, similar enough options for screening and early detection? much like we did when we first started to check for HIV and viral loads in, in the same regions 25 years ago. Um, we all, we can't have three and a half million dollar linear accelerators everywhere, you know? So can we find the diseases, like I said, to go upstream to detect and discern the signals of disease before they develop into something that requires those $15,000 a month pills. And so I, I think from a humanistic standpoint and an economics standpoint for global health equity, early identification of cancers, better identification of cancers in the earliest faintest footsteps might be the solution to all of our problems. Uh, we save more lives and we save more money and we improve access to care because we haven't let it get to the point that you need a medical oncologist or a radiation oncologist or a targeted therapy or immunotherapy. You answered my second question, what I was going to answer, but coming back to the first question, uh, how we can improve also i mean you said you did not have an access to the to the therapies which was on the clinical trials how we can make like i don't know i mean uh, what's your opinion maybe ai will help here or more advocacy to have quicker access to the yeah. life saving medications when we see a signal that we don't wait for many years i mean on the plane i was just like Two, two weeks ago, I was watching a movie on the laptop, the, uh, uh, how it's called, Fight fight to Leave, I think. It was 2008 movie, a documentary. And I mean, Emil Freireich was talking and he said, I, mean, I think it was in that movie or I, I heard somewhere else. It was, if we have, um, I mean, if we had similar like uh, policies, etc. I mean, ourselves, if we had this, back in the 60s or 50s, we would never ever cured leukemia. Yeah, but I think there's- there's What can we do? Are we overwhelming us with more policies or how, how we find the balance? Yeah, I, I think some of this, um, and this is a great Paul Farmer thing, right? He was one of the people that I most admire in medicine, one of the most selfless people who helped more humans on the planet than any other physician I know, but it's it's health literacy, right? It's health education, and it's not limited to just cancer. It's yeah. management of diabetes early in the southern states of America, where we have a rampant amount of uncontrolled obesity and diabetes. It's getting into West Virginia and Kentucky here, or a lot of places in uh, in Eastern Europe where smoking is the rule. It might be 30% of patients in some communities near you are smokers. Um, can we educate our young people so that the next generation isn't grappling with the same problems? We didn't have a lot of lung cancer in the States until after we uh, disseminated cigarettes into the trenches of World War I. Everybody died of tuberculosis or some communicable disease like they are in African uh, uh, places. We delivered cigarettes to our, our GI soldiers and they brought back lung cancer 15 years later. Can we educate people in the 13 year old, 14 year old, 15 year old uh, range? Can we do better? HPV vaccination to eliminate cervical cancer. Those sorts of things show so much promise to me. And since they're the most cost-effective way to battle diseases, I would love to see global health equity raised by just better education in general so that people can make the decisions about the foods that they put in their mouth, the alcohol they consume, the exercise that they pursue, and those sorts of things so that they never need one of us. That's very true. And um... Uh, but a lot of problems come also from the misinformation, right, which is spread on the social media. And both of us are quite active on uh, social media. But I mean, what do you think? What should we do more to uh, have like more results on the? I mean, or on the community base uh, level, on the I don't know, every professional need to do something. Or I mean, how we can fight this misinformation and like to educate more? Well, we we saw that a lot with COVID, didn't we? It really- uh, A lot of misinformation. 
Yeah, a lot yeah. of misinformation. It hurt millions of people around the globe. And, and ultimately, the people who were most harmed were the least educated uh, and the people with least access to care. So that, to me, is, is just proof of principle. We have to do better with public health globally. Uh, the WHO is empowered and funded to do so. Uh, but physicians like you and I, we have to be front and center and visible. Ultimately, the patients are going to trust you. They're hopefully going to trust me more than some government talking head or, you know, I've told my patients on on, uh, numerous uh, clinic visits when we're talking about COVID vaccinations and other, I don't want you to get your healthcare information from news channels on either the left or the right. I'd rather it be in the room with me where we've got a trusted five-year relationship and shoot, you let me put you through a bone marrow transplant but you won't take my advice about reducing your risk of death by COVID with a vaccine. And that really should not have been politicized. And it was unfortunate that it found itself in that area, but that's the world that we live in right now. And it's whoever screams the loudest wins. Uh, I'd rather wear them out with kindness and goodness and, uh, and evidence-based medicine myself. Uh, in, your, in your bio, it's written that you have a black belt as a, a for the Lean Six Sigma, right? Can you That's explain this? For, <laughs> I'm not, and I'm sure many people are also not much familiar with this. What so, it um, is and what you're Lean doing Six with Sigma, this. It's a, it's a school of thought and it's a training program that people go through, typically with engineering backgrounds and manufacturing backgrounds uh, designed to eliminate waste. And so they have yellow belts and green belts. And what, what I did was a, about a year of training learning tools that would help me do project management and project completion to eliminate errors. And that six sigma is when you get things errorless, um, you know, one in a million mistakes or mishaps. And we see that the way airlines are run. We see it when Toyota makes cars and we've seen it in companies like Motorola and GE are, are very, very big on these uh, engineering terms. I pursued it because in healthcare, we still have a ton of waste. We still have a lot of inefficiencies and we were building a new cancer center at the time. And so we did things where we said, okay, we're gonna follow some lean principles. Let's have one place to do blood draws for the whole building. So we don't have five floors of blood draws. Let's have one central place for everybody to check in and get a navigation tool. So this guides people around the building um, with an RFID Wi-Fi signal. There's 700 signals throughout our building. So I can track our patients like it's an air traffic control to work on operational issues and flow so patients aren't waiting in waiting rooms that they wouldn't perceive adds value. And so it's something I use in my daily life to just try and say, let's not do dumb things in healthcare. Let's do things that are efficient. Uh, ultimately, it's it's a very finite resource, as you know, in healthcare. And so if we can run a leaner operation, our patients get hours back, our staff gets to do the work that they're trained to do at top of license, and ultimately everybody's happier for it. Uh so uh, when I, I I read Black Belt, I I mean in my like imagination it was something associated with Jackie Chan and Chinese <laughs> <laughs> karate or Japanese. Yeah. I'm and, not, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> uh so you said also, I mean, recently you spent time uh, hiking in San Kitts, right? Mm -hmm. How do you find work-life balance? Well, I was uh, I was diagnosed with my own cancer um, about six and a half years ago. And I had a kidney cancer resected, and I hope I should be okay by now. Um, but it certainly reframes the way that you approach the world. And as you and I both know, we tend to do everything we can for our patients and for our teams, and we don't often take care of ourselves. So I'm 15 pounds heavier than I want to be, and I don't eat the way I should, and I'm fortunate I married a woman who loves to exercise and hikes religiously. So we've been all over the world chasing hikes. Uh, most recently it was in the Caribbean. She just got back from Chile and Argentina hiking for 16 days with my daughter. So I, I, I'm going to be hiking by, uh, by association because of the person I chose to marry. And I, I'm probably better off for it. <laughs> uh, what would be your uh, advice? to a younger generation, a new generation of oncologists? Well, I, I think work-life balance is hard, right? These young guys, they come out, they've got young kids, they're often stressed, they're on the computer at 11 o'clock at night, typing progress notes, and um, I would say take care of yourselves too. 
I didn't do that earlier in my career. My first 10 or 15 years, I would work 15 hours a day. I was just drinking Red Bulls all afternoon, every day, just to stay afloat. <laughs> And I would dictate notes until 11 o'clock at night and then do the same thing the next day. So I would say, number one is um, in your enthusiasm to save the world, save your family too, save yourselves too, and do the right things to sustain your life and your career early on and develop good habits. Uh, I didn't do that. And I wish I had. And I tell my brother that all the time. He's still really way busier than he should be, uh, but can't say no. Number two, I would say continuous daily learning has been big for me. I read a variety of things. And they're not all medical. I try and read one fun book. I try and read one Pulitzer Prize winner. And then I try and read one that's maybe a personal development book, you know, in that order. And I feel like over 20 years, I'm a much more well-rounded cancer doctor, a much more well-rounded person because I spent time doing that, even if it's just listening to podcasts or listening to books in your car on the way to and from the clinics, because uh, not everybody has time to read at night before they fall asleep. But uh, I guess those would be the two things I found most reflecting uh, at 52. I, I think those were well, well-placed efforts. Um, how do you manage your time? I mean, do you use some apps or like any recipe? Because this is kind of a quite difficult stuff usually for the people to, to do the time management. Yeah. You know, uh, cancer doctors specifically, their, their days are often very scheduled, right? We live in 15 or 20 minute blocks on my clinic day. I don't do well. I'm always behind. <laughs> so I, I just like the rest of us, I do the best I can. On my non-clinic days, I use a, a, a thing called time boxing, where I try and write in every 30 minute a box of what I need to get done that day. And I start out with three things I must accomplish, and then a brain dump of things I'd love to get to that I often don't get to. And I, I try and build in as many things as I can so that there are spaces saved for all the things that I try and do. Um, with the advent of AI, there's very little that I write these days that I don't use tools to do. And I might hop back and forth between four or five different GPT models um, to edit a piece that I need to write quickly um, or to give me an outline for a program that I want to build or a press release of something that I want to hand to one of my teams, say, this is what we should try and be building to and work backwards from this press release. And I found that using um, generative AI has really made me more efficient with those tools. I can do three hours worth of work in 20 minutes now. And I don't spend my entire day buried in my email inbox anymore. I have uh, a lot of programs to help me finish those and, and clear my inboxes better. Um, I, I was reading another like professional development book. Maybe it's like a four hour work work week. I think yeah. something yeah. like that. I've seen and that one. You, yeah, very good book. And do you think we are going to get there? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep adding things to my plate. No, I, I, I'm, I still have a 55 hour work week, but I love what I do. And I don't consider it all work. I worked both days all weekend um, on things that are, I'm interested in, you know, this AI and precision oncology journal is a labor of love. It's not something that is, I'm not going to earn anything really from it. It's something that I want to get this out into the world and make oncologist days easier. And I thought that sharing it in an evidence-based peer-reviewed fashion was the best way to earn the trust of the oncologist for these tools. Um, but yeah, that's my weekends these days as I get up and I have a coffee at seven in the morning and then I get to work and uh, I enjoy what I do. So I, I don't know if I would do well with a four, four hour work week. Uh, I think my wife you would, would get bored, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. I think my wife would want me out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else you would like to share with, with uh, the people who are listening to us or who are going to listen to us? Yeah, I just I appreciate the opportunity to share this stuff and the things you guys are doing. Onco Daily is great. It's helping the rest of us keep up and everything that you guys are sharing. I'm often adding the people that I should be following on social media that I wasn't before because you brought them to my attention. So you keep working and uh, the rest of us are enjoying your work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Flora. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And thanks a lot for all what you are doing and have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. You too. Thank you.